I'm Wes Whedon. When I was a young man of 27, just out of optometry school, I was fortunate to meet two of the most iconic film celebrities around, Betty Davis and Mae West. I'd seen most of their films, but I didn't know a lot about their personal lives. In those days, the private lives of a film star weren't as public as they are today. So it was a real privilege to meet them in person. You hear stories about celebrities that sometimes don't match what they portray on screen. So when you meet a celebrity, you can be surprised by their personality and behavior. I'd heard that Betty was opinionated, abrupt, difficult, and sometimes even hostile towards people. Personally, I never experienced any of that with her. But I did witness it when she interacted with people she didn't particularly like. You selfish bitch. I'd heard that Mae West was humorous, sensual, and suggestive. A master at double entendre, after men, very successful and well invested. What I didn't know was that Mae's wealth was primarily the result of her real estate investments. She was a shrewd businesswoman, a self-contained package of filmmaking skill, able to conceive, write, direct, cast, act in, and market her own films. She hired actors of color and other minorities. She was often controversial, writing plays from a woman's point of view on prostitution and homosexuality, subjects no one ever touched. Betty had been in the forefront of movie politics. She supported the Hollywood Canteen during the war years, giving members of the armed forces a place to gather and relax when off duty. She had a huge following because of her innovative acting skills and her strong character portrayal. They were indeed two iconic women, each fascinating in their own way. I was fortunate to be present that night, the night they met. And if you ever wondered what two women like Betty Davis and Mae West would discuss, sit tight. You're about to find out. It wasn't much past three in the afternoon when Vic called me and said, Madame is already into the orange juice, which was code for vodka with a splash of OJ. Betty was in town to do a TV film, staying with my next door neighbor, Charles Pollock, and his houseman, Vic Greenfield, who had been Betty's prior personal assistant. I met Betty when she first arrived. I became her eye doctor, and we got to be social friends. I would get what I called Betty duty whenever Chuck and Vic were out of their house. We'd share a meal, have drinks, and talk mostly about her, but we always had a good time. I found Betty unusually nervous. She was chain smoking, drinking a cocktail, and ironing her dress. Betty ordered Vic to take a photo of the two of us. He got the Polaroid and snapped a picture. Then I took off to help get things ready. It was then Betty realized that she had left the iron on her dress, scorching it. One evening, she asked me to be her bartender at an upcoming dinner party for a very famous guest. May West, and I eagerly accepted. I owned a small portable cassette deck, and I thought it would be fun to record May's famous voice. I presented the idea to the household, and everyone agreed with me. As the doorbell rang, we were all apprehensive about how our hostess would conduct herself after drinking orange juice cocktails most of the day. Miss West's escorts for the evening were Stanley Musgrove and Glenn Shahan. Hi, it's Dan Musgrove. How are you? Mr. Musgrove had briefly represented May in a PR firm he started, and he occasionally escorted her to social events. How do you do? Hi, Hi Chuck. How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi. Glenn Shahan was a publicist who knew Chuck Pollock. He likely suggested to Chuck that the dinner for Betty and May be set up. Betty and May had not previously met. Betty seemed a bit starstruck and definitely nervous to meet May but she'd done her homework and familiarized herself with May's career. I don't believe it. <laughs> I really mean, few people in our industry, I have felt, just great. Yeah, so well, I accepted the invitation to so far every year, didn't I? Why are you saying this? I thought you'd be there. And you never 
It was strange that Miss West hadn't attended. She had a long history with Adolf Zucker, beginning in the 1930s with Paramount's successful adaptation of her play, Diamond Lil, into a picture titled, She'd Done Him Wrong. And I was mad, so I had sort of a little cold coming on, and I was afraid I'd be spreading it around and getting the whole thing off. Yeah, particularly with, with old man Zucker. At the Palladium, the marquee heralds the stellar attraction, the 80th birthday celebration of Adolf Zucker, One thousand notables toast Mr. Zucker and his wife. Well, Vic and I thought it was good. Yeah. May had indeed recorded albums beginning with the fabulous Mae West in 1956. Then in 1966, she recorded a rock album, Way Out West, and a holiday album titled Wild Christmas, May and December. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Orange juice was Betty's code for an early day vodka cocktail. May didn't drink alcohol. Both Vic and Chuck were fearful that Betty would serve May herself, so they jumped to beat her to it. Orange juice? We have a target. I don't believe I'm being. I have to take it. Everybody else in this house. I've never met anyone whom I have admired. Same studio. This is right. Let's put the same studio. The same studio. You sort of walk into people. You know, my admiration. Well, she was just telling us on the way over. She said, "I've just been crazy about everything she's ever done." Well, that's the night. She wanted to meet me. Always wanted to meet her. And this is great. You're something. Casting the lead role of Captain Cummings proved difficult. The story goes that one afternoon leaving her production meeting, May spotted a tall and handsome dark-haired man walking across the lot. She asked who he was and remarked, if he can talk, I'll take him. He was Cary Grant. Little tiny guy, so kind of nothing guy at that point. I should come up sometimes, see me. Ah, oh, you can be had. They had a whole week, one. Oh, yeah. Week in Westport, all my West pictures. <laughs> Did you see it in the theater or on television? Television. Late night television. Oh, I'm trying to see it on the theater. It's the last one we put, you know. You don't talk anything the way you talk in the movie. Oh, the characterization. When I was doing it then. Oh, no, I didn't do it. No, no. I can't take you. It's so beautiful. But May wrote her own scripts, did you know? Did you? Yeah, I think so did I. Despite Betty's comment, she never received writing credit for any of her early films, but she probably gave input on dialogue for the characters she portrayed. May, on the other hand, wrote all of her own dialogue, demanding credit and payment in all of her films. When I did Voyager, which is a great book by a woman named Mrs. Crockett, I used to go home every night from the script I had, write out every foot of dialogue from the book and bring it back to the director and say, this we shoot today. Known for her dramatic character contrast... You haven't a very high opinion of yourself, have you? ...and sudden mood swings, Betty could have easily suggested how this scene plays out. Perhaps this will help you know why. Who's the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair? A spinster aunt. Uh, where are you? Taking a picture? 
I'm the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair. I'm poor Aunt Charlotte. And I've been ill. I've been in a sanitarium for three months. And I'm not well yet. Tears to joy in 30 seconds. Feeling better? Much. Thanks to you, or many, many thanks to you. Thanks for what? For helping me feel that there were a few moments when I... when I almost felt alive. Thank you. Thank you who? Thank you, Jerry. You wouldn't have any careers if you never written on this I have television rights to do anything I want. I can win and make a, a live show on television of any of my pictures. I have the book rights, I have the play rights, I have... Yeah, but you were very smart you yeah. did this early. And now, they're showing them on that I don't get anything out of it. Film work for actors in the studio system of the 1930s was arduous and not very glamorous. Work hours were unrestricted, Breaks and meals were often missed. Studio bosses dictated your parts, told you who to date and marry, where to be seen, what your morals should be, and even which politicians to vote for. You didn't get much chance to choose a part or express yourself in your work. Contracts often lasted seven years and were not easy to break. Like it or not, you could be forced to renew, especially if your pictures made money. In 1936, Betty Davis and Olivia de Havilland spoke out, along with others, risking their careers to start the Screen Actors Guild, a union which established work rules and pay scales for actors. It was a battle to get the studios to agree to SAG terms, but in 1937, an agreement was reached. When NCA was ordered to divest itself of its agency, or be prosecuted in 48 hours or something. There was also a very classy deal made by Reagan on behalf of the Guild, which got all kinds of um, television residuals. Well, Reagan got money from all the producers by selling us out. Well, well he certainly was backed by Jules Stein. In no, 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 no. Uh, no one. Well, Jack Warner, but, but Jules Stein also. No, 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 I don't believe this. I will never, I, I will never agree with this. Not for this time. Jules Stein, who co-founded MCA, had been Betty's agent for many years, and she considered him a personal friend. She could not believe that his company had worked against paying residuals for her early films when shown on TV. But in fact, it had. Betty believed actors should be paid residuals when their films were shown on television. In 1960, SAG went on strike asking producers for those residuals and for a producer-funded actor's pension and welfare plan. Ronald Reagan was SAG president and members expected him to be a tough negotiator. But he was bargaining with friends at MCA who had gotten him a lot of television work and had helped make him SAG president. When he did not succeed getting what SAG members wanted, many felt he had sold them out. See, he was president of Screen Actors Guild at that yeah. time, Ronnie Gray. Oh, well, I sat there and I went to the meeting. I'll tell you. Ultimately, the 1960 strike was settled, with actors winning residuals for films made after 1960, but not before. And producers agreed to pay a lump sum of $265 million to create the Guild Pension and Welfare Fund for all actors meeting minimum work requirements retroactive to 1948. Still, many veterans like Betty were not happy with Ronald Reagan's leadership. He later resigned his union presidency, then ran for and won governor of California and finally U.S. president. Mr. Reagan got all his money, got all the money from the producers that wanted to make him governor of California. Yeah. And I tell you, now it wasn't so bad, but it's not for you. We got some dumb but, but little guys, little guys, you would have heard screaming in that room that time. It would have been great for me to sit around and have Sam the richest woman in the world. But those little, beautiful, basic actors, they should have had this money. Oh, 
In 1911, at age 17, May secretly married Frank Wallace, an actor. It was more for security than love. They stayed together only a short time before he went on the road, and they became estranged. May never revealed she was married until, as her fame grew, Frank began calling himself Mr. May West. She divorced him. But you see, as soon as I go round with the guy and everything that he proposed to me, I couldn't say, oh, I'm married. He must have gotten the papers. So I just get away from him, you know what I mean? And then meet somebody else. And it was good that I did that way. And you, is that you met? I met an awful lot of men. <laughs> she said, I really fell in love with this guy. He would, you know, buy me diamonds and everything. And she said, I really cared for him a lot. She said, the only problem was I found out that he was involved in the mob. And he even financed some of her early stage shows. And she said, she said, I really had to break it off. She said, because I didn't want to be identified with that. His name was Owen Madden. That was pretty much the love of her life. The only other person that came closest probably was Paul Novak. In July 1954, May opened what she called her Muscle Man Nightclub Act at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas. Among the cast were Richard Dubois, 1954 Mr. America, Joe Gold, who started Gold's Gym, Mr. Universe George Epperman, and Mr. America, 1955 Paul Novak, who served May as her devoted live-in companion, bodyguard, cook, and personal trainer. I would write my books and things and characters that I had in my pictures and everything, you know, and situations. Then I finally had Timothy, who was my mother's attorney, and then he became infatuated with me, and he and my mother put up the money for my first play, Sex, you know. Oh, you did? Yeah. May opened her play Sex in New York City in 1926 during a commercial slump on Broadway. It was a scandalous story about a prostitute, and May intended it to disrupt standards of propriety. It turned out to be a hot ticket. Headlines proclaimed that May's performance made it a hit. Her audience of soldiers, sailors, and students that stood in line for tickets certainly thought so. Sex, played to full houses, was a financial success and the only play to survive the summer and continue into the fall of that year. Yeah, but he stuck around me and, and uh, uh, I was, you know, man, I used to have to hide my man. I used to have to hide him in the closet and then he was, he lived in the same building, you know. Me and then oh, suddenly oh. come in and bang the door and close. <laughs> and the other closet, you know, push the guy in the closet. You know, I'm almost like that in huh? my life. <laughs> oh, well, brother. <laughs> I had to go to some of the situations that I experienced. Because he can't write about it. In some of the pictures, I knew some of them. But yeah. if I ever used really some of them, they were terrific. May, did you ever know a fella named Starlight? Starlight? Yeah, something Starlight. My Starlight, 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 Starlight. And my father, when he was a, a young guy, he was a prom at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. You were there. He was what? He was at a, a prom, you know, high school prom yeah. at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. And he said, met you and some fella, Benny Starlight, and it was during Prohibition, and he was passing drinks to all these kids in high school. Well, I don't know. I never lived in that hotel. Yeah. yeah. The first husband sang there every night in the grill. Yeah. Who's that? Man. Sure. Man Nelson sang at that grill every night. That was his first job. He was a musician. He was a bloody good musician. He was killed, wasn't he? One of your husbands was 
August 23, 1943, Arthur Fonsworth collapsed on Hollywood Boulevard while walking to his car. He was taken to Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital where he died two days later. The cause of death was a brain hemorrhage resulting from a skull fracture. Later, Betty described a severe fall down a long flight of stairs that he took in their New Hampshire home in June. You know, Joyce Hayward, one of the roasters, and she said, Betty Davis, Nelson, Farnsworth, Sherry, Merrill, I salute you, and I would like to miss to her. And I really wanted to get up that night and say what died, but I thought it would be so rude. So there she sits. Miss Betty Davis, Nelson, Farnsworth, Sherry, Merrill. <laughs> Just for <laughs> she had was with Paul Novak. He stayed with her for 25 years and acted as her bodyguard and manager. He kind of oversaw all of her business. Well, you are very smart. <laughs> I have never done that. Yeah. I have never done that so many years. It's right. I'm a virgin, an old virgin. Well, but age has nothing to do with it. Oh, it has with me. Oh, it's true. I at the time they met, Betty was 65 years old and May was 80, but admitted to 78. And she quipped, the important thing about me is I still look like May West. 
Well, I had three children. I never was about to this bit for them. Now they're all gone from my life, you know. I live my own little yeah, separate life. Yeah, but you life. gotta meet a man now that inspires you. I haven't seen one in 20 years that inspires me. And that's sad, you know. But I really don't care. Oh, my God. I've had a great sexual life for about 50 years of my life. gave birth to Barbara Davis Sherry, known as B.D., while married to William Grant Sherry. She later adopted Michael and Margot, while married to fourth husband Gary Merrill. I happen to have the luck to have a great daughter. Just luck. Just luck. How lovely that is for you. My dear, I have three children and the luckiest one in the world. Yeah, I have. I love you. Would you like to Betty and May held different opinions on having a family and a career. May only wanted a career, while Betty tried to manage having both. Nobody else likes it. Yeah, that's for sure. All right. This is the crazy thing. Betty needed and wanted to continue working as an actor. With few film roles offered, she took up work in television. She soon realized TV production was not done with the same professional standards and attention to detail as her early work in film. She was accustomed to respect and professionalism on a set, which she did not always get. And now as an older performer, she was working with much younger directors and crew who often had no knowledge of her early work. She referred to them as kids. Now, half the kids you could meet in the television area today, you might say, well, now Miss West is coming on the set. Couldn't get shit. These horrible little kids, they couldn't kill us. You mean the people who were making these Oh, these are. They had all their kids on television about 35 years ago, you know. And this has been my great good fortune. So television, even though we didn't get the residuals, it's an all in life. And you know, I do this town hall thing, I do with questions and answers. If I really would have gone to New York for that, if I had known it would have Well, it was something. New Yorker magazine acclaimed Betty's live appearance in Town Hall Theater a resounding hit with all the glamour and trappings of a Hollywood premiere. In limousines, crowds of well-dressed patrons, and an audience that applauded every word and gesture Miss Davis made from the stage, including lighting a cigarette. 
No film, video, or audio recording of Betty's town hall appearance has survived, but Gary Springer, who was there with his family, gives his recollection as a teenager of the evening. My, my father was John Springer, and he basically started the independent press world. My father loved the ladies. He created the legendary ladies of the cinema. The, the evening started with my dad would come out and, and you know, in black tie and, and make an introduction. Uh, you know, tonight you're going to see, and named all of Betty's characters. I'll never forget, fasten your seatbelts, and then, and then boom, Betty walking out, and that entire town hall just erupting. And Betty just stood there at the edge of the stage without saying anything for a while in this kind of flowing black, uh, I, I remember it had, I think it had feathers or something like that. And, and, and everybody went wild. And throughout the whole thing, every time she said a line, every time, every clip, it was just like screaming and laughing and applauding. It was loaded with gay men. Every one of them rushed the stage. Betty, I want to be you, Betty. I love you. I am you, Betty. They were dressed as Baby Jane. They were. They had ba Betty Davis dolls. Just mass hysteria. They had to shut down 43rd Street in front of Town Hall because it was just. It was just mobbed. Nobody was going home. Everybody was staying there. Tears were coming down people's faces. But she was a nervous lady at the beginning of it, I think, you know, not not knowing how it was going to be, because she really hadn't been out there for a while. This hadn't been done. This is a, a, a new format that people really didn't get, um, but it clicked and it worked. And, 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 and she was just ecstatic. They know more about that. You can't believe. All that crowd, they like the pictures you made much better than what they made now that Stories now, and they want to make it funnier. Yeah. Wrap it up, you know. Like you said earlier, that. no humor. You can't do that long. I'm making a movie right now that I'm so sick of making. But you know, I get bored every now and then. I say, God, I better work. And I was out here and we gave this horrible script. Oh, I was sick of you talking. Movie of the week or a movie of the week? One of the ABC. Betty was filming a mystery thriller, Scream Pretty Peggy, an ABC TV movie of the week. This scene shows Betty's lack of enthusiasm for the project. I think I'm glad. I kept quiet for so long. I could get drunk as often as I wanted to. Betty was quoted, the film had a Peggy in it, but no screams except for my silent ones. My trailer, 7.30, and anybody opened it up from 8 o'clock. Well, you're listening to it pretty well. <laughs> Oh, that's so hard. Usually, at least Universal usually has things like that working, but, but the material on the screen is so hot. It's a marvelously functioning place. What do you mean it's a marvelously functioning well, place, Universal? For the most part, with, with as many pictures, television wow. pictures they make, it it's just that they, that they rush you so. Not all TV films were a bad experience for Betty. When she had a good script, was treated with respect, and given good direction, her work excelled, as Waris Hussein recounts when directing Little Gloria Happy at Last. One of the reasons she was apprehensive of television was because in many ways that was what she was forced into after many years as a major, major movie actress, movie star. She watched me setting up the whole set scene. And then she called me over and she said, um, you do know I finish at six o'clock on my contract, even if I'm in mid-sentence. So I said, yes, I do know, Miss Davis. She said, well, are you going to get through with me on that time? I said, well, I'm going to try. She said, yes, you are. You're going to try, aren't you? So we started shooting and it went on and on and on. And on. At six o'clock, we got nowhere near. <laughs> and she summoned me over and she said, um, you're not going to finish with me, are you? I said, no, Miss Davis, I'm not. She said, well, if I go, you're not going to finish the sequence and then you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I'll stay until we finish, but I'm not doing it for those men over there. And she pointed to these producers. <laughs> so I said, well, when do you think we're going to finish, Miss Davis? She said, 10 o'clock tonight? I said, oh, I don't think so. Do you know what? Precisely 10 o'clock at night, we let her go. <laughs> May enjoyed Betty's early Warner Brothers films when they were shown on television, but they were a source of anguish for Betty. Well, I'm speaking of her own pictures, but we put them on television. 
Oh, well, they're all fine. I don't know what company controls those Warner Brothers pictures. Well, no, that was so in the beginning. The first seller was Warner Brothers, $11,000. Eight thirty-one. And 65 of those films were mine. Okay. Now, you see, I was a lucky woman. Those films came on day after day after day. I was lucky. All the kids saw my films. Do you know who won a soldier for $11,000? The only films it was pitiful. Like Betty's town hall appearance with a live audience, Miss Wet had also appeared on stage to answer questions about her films, writing, and acting career. They saw my picture. I didn't know that. I didn't know which picture they saw. They showed I'm no angel. You know, oh, the yes. Yes. Had I known that, I would have perhaps talked about, you know. I always wanted to be a lion tamer. From a child up, I had an obsession. To get in that cage with the lions. And then finally, on my second picture, they said, What do you want to do next? Uh, anything you want to do. Because they knew I'd write it and everything. And I said, Well, they said, We want to spend a lot of money on the next picture. Well, a circus story. We'll spend a lot of money on that. They said, Fine. So that was my one ambition. So I thought, Well, here it goes now. Get in that cage with the lions. I'd never do it again. The day that I was ready to shoot to go in the cage with the lions, I think they had about six or eight lions. They had me sitting there for about 20 minutes, and I said, well, here, look, I'm ready. What's going on here? Let's start, let's shoot. And uh, the director come over and he says, I'm thinking about getting a double for you. I said, what do you mean a double for me? I said, I'm not gonna go in there. This is the main reason I was doing the picture, <laughs> is to get in that cage with the lions. They said, well, did you see what happened? I said, no, what happened? It seemed that China, one lion almost tore his arm off and they took him to the hospital. Five minutes before I went in, I was ready. I says, well, take the one that did it and get him out of that cage. I said, well, we don't know which one did it, because they all look alike. So I said, well, go over and look, the one that has blood on his arm. And I finally got in there, and I didn't make them do the tricks. They put the tricks in later. I had them jumping this way and that way and snarling and, you know, and cracking the whip and all. Jeez. I must have been crazy to get in that cage. You wouldn't do it again. No, I wouldn't do it. It's such fun. You know, it's incredible. Throughout her film career, May came up against censorship from an office run by Will Hayes, which was set up by the film industry to develop and administer a code of ethics to safeguard against filming any situation, action, or line of dialogue capable of corrupting the mind or morals of a child. It was known as the Hayes Code, and May was determined to work around it. The code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. It states the considerations which good taste and community value make necessary in this universal form of entertainment. Don't tell you why. Because you, you have humor with your sex. I'm really not a very good dancer. And just take two steps forward then. Oh, you know they Yeah, they were kicking. 
The May did open the drag in New York City in February 1927. Billed as a homosexual comedy in three acts, it drew the ire of local moralists and the police. The cast included 17 female impersonators and chorus boys. May was amused by their witty remarks and campy actions and wanted to feature them in the play. Local law enforcement did not share the same views. They shut down the show, hauled May and her cast into night court, and later jailed as a crowd of onlookers cheered from the street. The actors were charged with indecent performance, public nuisance, and corrupting the morals of youths and others. May's backers bailed everyone out, and the following night, record crowds purchased tickets. You were the original boys in the band. Oh, that's right. They have a free time to practice their songs. And that's all I had to do, and then when I saw the boys in the band and read it, they only didn't get into women's clothes, but all the type of dialogue and everything that they were doing was in my play. But I took it to the lawyer, Harold Fendler, and he says, they took it so cleverly. I said, there's nothing that you can sue them on. He said, but the fragments of it, and the whole idea is there. It's just like a song, you yeah. steal a certain yeah, amount that's of it. Yeah, that's it, same amount. Absolutely amazed when you made that first move. When she first came to Hollywood, she, you know, had a contract with uh, Paramount to do Night After Night. It was very successful. Um, George Raff commented that uh, having Mae West in the movie, she stole everything but the cameras. Her next film was She Done Him Wrong, which was the movie version of Diamond Lil, her stage success. And with her next two pictures, She Done Him Wrong and I'm No Angel, both with Cary Grant, she um, broke all box office records. There are not a lot of movies out there that can really claim they actually saved a film studio from bankruptcy, but this movie, She Done Him Wrong, certainly can. When Paramount released it in 1933, the studio was very close to the brink of disaster. But then along came Mae West in this film, and. Suddenly, the ledgers went from being a wash in red ink to black at Paramount. No, I had played from coast to coast for five hours with my plays, and I had a big. What do you mean that? Well, did you think it would be an enormous success? No, I figured that the prices they were paying and what they were getting, and I knew that my box was I broke records, so I would never go on the road when I had my play Sex and the Wicked Age. Now, with that little, I had to go. They shoot us insisted. I didn't want to go on the road, see? Because I figured I'd, in every city I'd go, I'd have sense of trouble, you know. And everybody come in on me, you know. I couldn't go through all that. So I went anyway, see? And I broke everybody's records. I could say. Before the movie. Yeah, that's before. So I had, I had such a public, and then I stayed for a couple of years in New York with by play sex, and I had front pages for two months, you know, because I started all that sex stuff in the title of the play, and then everybody started writing plays about sex, epidemic, you know. And then I had to close them all down, you know what I mean, because they were so filthy. 
See, they didn't realize that I had a great plot, I had a great story. I didn't even use a hell of a damn in anything. Everything was sex with personality and with the type and of And you end up. Yeah, that's the way. And they put in SBs and B, they call her a bitch and they call her this and that. I never did that. See, and they thought they were better than me because they put these words in and it was just the wrong thing to do, see? And they didn't have a good story. Well, the thing is, you never did anything that was offensive. No, no. Everything was Of course not. The whole thing was the great number. If you were a suggestion by it. Well, she made history of the sound. I went through all that era with you, and it was smashing. Class. You see, that she has that personality that you're never going to forget. You just see her up there, you know, she projects. Can't do that, you see? see this? Like, like I'll never forget any of those movies you make. Right. Mm, just a mouse studying to be a rat. Don't you think you're a little forward on such short acquaintance? You're compromising me. Besides, we're intellectual opposites. What do you mean? Well, I'm intellectual and you're opposite. Pastor Manena. I didn't know you spoke Spanish. Don't think I worked in Tijuana for nothing. Oh, Bueller. Yes, ma'am. Peel me a grape. Oh, in good taste. Very good. Two popular female impersonators of this time were Charles Pierce and Greg Russell. Their impersonations were always based on popular actresses with distinctive style. Betty Davis, Mae West, Tallulah Bankhead, and Carol Channing, among others. You do know who I am? <laughs> How nice. Really nice. That's right. See, you played me and a few others. I got a lot. You do? No, I'm saying, if I imitate her, I know how to imitate how she speaks. Well, and I know how you take me, certain things. This is the first thing you do. You puff like mad. <laughs> now you rotate this. <laughs> and then, and then you say, Tita. Oh, yeah, you're not imitating you guys. Well, I think we have two differences of opinion here. I think Ray doesn't like imitation. Right? Well, I like them all. They exaggerate. They keep doing it and doing it. And they keep 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 doing it. And I went to live at my beach house. They go over me, they hit my gown. You know, he used to try them on, you know. So I'd be down there and he didn't have this gown on and this wig on and everything. So I finally, I said, well, finally, doing an imitation, but he's saying the wrong things. I think he does you and he does, uh, who else does he do? He does Carol Channing and Carol uh, Chan Tulu. And Tulu? Well, he's dead now, so he's yeah. stop this. He does Betty Davis, he does yeah. Tulu Beckett, yeah. he yeah. does, uh, you know, he does you. Well, that's what he does. What well, are natural to do? Yeah, but look to him. She has a definite Chad, you want to get after him. That's the only style. You know the thing that he said about him? He says, that mouth is that big, it's as big as something else, you know. <laughs> he uses the voice language and some terrible things, you know, people up there. Vicious things. 
Will you put in a stop to the I stopped them. Sure. I, I cut my invitation out. I wouldn't have to do it. I stopped them. You can legally do I, that. You see, he isn't doing May, May West. He's doing Diamond Little. Because when I get up there, do, I do Diamond Little. In every picture that I do, it's Diamond Little. It's a characterization that I created and I own. And it's copyrighted. You can imitate anyone. You can imitate the president, anybody. If you just do them, you know what I mean? But when you take a characterization that you created and you copyrighted, no, then they're infringing on my property. See, he's doing that. You don't walk in all the stuff that, you know, I mean, that, that, that's the characterization. I don't do that in real life. The obvious is, the city has not, you don't. If I walked around and acted that way all the time, I couldn't stop him. I can stop him because he's doing my property that I copyrighted and owned. Made and, yours. And, and professionally, yeah, made that's yours. It. That's it. Besides Foster and her image as a glamorous film star and celebrity, May was a solid businesswoman. She was the highest paid female star of her era. She demanded and received top pay for her performances. She never appeared in a film without a contract stating she could write her own lines and in many cases the entire script and receive screen credit. Her dialogue was a source of revenue and she was not about to let anyone use her lines without permission. She was all business and wanted to make sure she always gave the performance that her public expected. This boy that I'm talking about, he did 30 minutes of May West. He took a book that I have out, The Wit and Wisdom of May West with all of my wise cracks, all the lines, all the clever lines that I put in pictures and all the stuff, that book, I don't know if you ever read it. You want to, to imitate you for 30 minutes? Oh, what it oh, means? Yeah, yeah. All the stuff, all my brains, and maybe take a day to think of some great line. And here he was out there and getting good money for it, you know what I mean? And that's what I have to if he went out and did a couple of... Yeah, I agree. He got into very dirty and very rotten. It's not necessary. No. Oh, God. Miss West was the most natural human being in the world to live with. Jesus Christ. Charles Pierce performed on stage and cleverly wrote material that his characters would likely say. Miss West never took issue when he impersonated her because he wrote his own material in a Mae West style. All of his material was original, not stolen. I love Las Vegas. I went up to the gambling tables a few weeks ago and there was a tall, dark, and handsome croupier. He said, Miss West, I'd love to lay you 10 to one. I said, an odd time, but I'll be there. <laughs> Have you seen some imitations of you, Betty, that you like and some that offend you as well? Yes, of course. Because you're wired to be imitated. No. Right? I like some of This West will tell you. I like some of If you can't be imitated, you have not me. I will agree with May. If I imitate you, you will not be. Well, I heard there was a movie that was made. Uh, the parody of Lady J. Oh, no, no. In fact, there was a camp underground parody on Whatever Happened to Baby Jane titled What Really Happened to Baby Jane, which featured male actors in drag and gained cult popularity in the late 1960s and 70s. I didn't mean to ring for my breakfast. I was just wondering who all those people were.
if they that. don't imitate you in this world, boy, you ain't got no self. Right. But right. right. I mean, listen, mm-hmm. there's only like five of you. May, you, Oh, may, yeah, come on. There are many, many. many. You know, one line of love, that's all. Yeah, they can't imitate you. They can't imitate you. They can't imitate you. They can't imitate They can't imitate Betty had to do a bit of impersonating in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane when she had to sound like her sister, Blanche, played by Joan Crawford. Just that nosy Mrs. Bates going on about your picture last night. Oh, really? Did she like it? Oh, really? Did she like it? We had to have her voice. You know, there's no way she that you could imitate. No. You could only imitate that smile and bless you. So that wasn't going to do it. So anyway, he went to Joe and said, would you make the tape recording of your voice and the conversation has to be cool with people? Debbie will mimic it. She came to me and said, you can't imitate me. I said, no, Joe. But she was so bloody thrilled I couldn't imitate her. I thought, my God, this woman is absolutely nuts because I was something. <laughs> there was no way to make a vocal thing like hers. So she made the record, and I on the phone mimicked her voice. When Jane's order to the liquor store was declined, Betty, playing Jane, had to make the clerk at the store think her sister Blanche was placing the order. Hello. Who is this, please? Oh, yes, Mr. Carson. Yes, this is Blanche Hudson. May I tell you, in line with your, if anybody can't imitate you, you would sue them. As I walked up to the balcony, I said to Chuck, it only reminds me of a line when Miss Davis looked over the balcony and said, Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. There's a great story about the gown Betty wore when she delivered her Fasten Your Seatbelt line. The dress still exists and is preserved in the collection of Greg Schreiner, who displays it in his musical stage show, Hollywood Revisited. Well, the Betty Davis gown started originally for Claudette Calvert. A few days before filming was to begin, she hurt her back. So they frantically looked for someone to replace her, and the obvious choice then was Betty Davis. So they brought Betty in. Her first scene coming up was, which was in this particular dress. When they put it on, they discovered that the top was actually too large and did not stay up on her shoulders. Betty saw herself in a mirror with this off-the-shoulder thing, and she loved it. She says, don't touch a thing. It's kind of fun that a mistake turned into one of the most iconic dresses of Betty's. Betty, can you do an imitation of Betty? No. Would you right. can you do the Betty West character, Betty? Come on, do it. That would be fun. No, no, no. We all can do the Betty West character. Now, you see, she comes into the as a professional. But you see, that's the great thing to stay in that. No, but can you do it well? Not, not just to come up and see me sometime, but what would be another line that... No, it's anything she wants to say. It's a beautiful thing. But she doesn't talk like that. That's fun to know. Now, May, have you ever thought about doing Betty Davis? Have you ever done an invitation to Betty no, Davis? No, there's no way she did. Because I never asked her. Well, well I'd have to watch it, what she's doing. I'm seeing herself. I mean, he does have a beer, and she does do imitations in a way. You have done that. Yeah, but she ain't gonna imitation me. I know that. It's not in your bag to do an imitation. No, I don't know. No, it's not of that. You don't do imitations. No, no. You do dialects. Yeah, I do dialects. Yes. Yeah. About this point in the evening, after many cocktails, Chuck and Vic felt it was time to get their guests to the dinner table. Now I have the pleasure. Obligatory photos were then taken. I'm out of tape.
You know, reflecting back on this meeting now some 40 years ago, I can really appreciate these women as the iconic figures they are. Things they did and said, in person and in film, have assured them of a place in our hearts. This was an evening of bumpy nights and fastened seatbelts, of Betty Davis eyes and of come up and see me sometime. And those inside stories that few people know, they were amazing for me. It's now common to stand up for your rights in the workplace. Betty Davis was one of the first actors to do this, and she opened the door for others to follow. Today, there are many women in the ranks of film production, screenwriting, and directing, but Mae West did this in the 1930s. The passing of time and new generations of film fans coming up who are wowed by the likes of Lady Gaga and Madonna, it's easy to forget that they had predecessors. In a way, Betty Davis and Mae West paved the road that women today walk down on their way to the glamour of the red carpet. I will never forget that evening. It was joyous, funny, frank, and enlightening. A real life biography. It gave me an insight into two stars showing mutual respect for each other's work, and it connected generations of filmmaking. It was a slice in time of hidden Hollywood history that I wanted to share with you. So many people know me. I wish I did. I wish someone would tell me about me. Besides something spelled out in light bulbs, I mean. Besides something called a temperament, which consists mostly of swooping about on a broomstick, screaming at the top of my voice. Infants behave the way I do, you know. They carry on and misbehave. They'd get drunk if they knew how. When they can't have what they want. When they feel unwanted or insecure or unloved. More than anything in this world, I want him to want me, but me, not Margot Channing. And if I can't tell them apart, how can he? Funny business a woman's career. The things you drop on your way up the ladder so you can move faster. You forget you'll need them again when you go back to being a woman. That's one career all females have in common, whether we like it or not, being a woman. Sooner or later, we've got to work at it no matter what other careers we've had or wanted. And in the last analysis, nothing is any good unless you can look up just before dinner or turn around in bed, and there he is. Without that, you're not a woman. You're something with a French provincial office or a book full of clippings but you're not a woman. Slow curtain, the end.